for every UCSC gathering these days. The land upon which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Upi, Upi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of descendants of indigenous people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. And that's a lot of what we're gonna hear about today is um, becoming traditional stewards of sorts in our own backyards and uh, healing historical trauma environmentally in other ways. Next, please. Okay, so like I said, the Friends of the Farm and Garden are the sponsors. If you're not a member, I recommend you become a member. Uh, the main uh, benefit to you is that you get 10% off on plants, tools, and more at San Lorenzo Garden and other garden centers. And frankly, one visit in the spring for me pays for my membership all year long. It's <laughs> so easy to do. <laughs> we also have uh, special workshops and events that are just for, for members and uh, early entry into our garden, our plant sale, which is going to happen this year. So um, to become a friend, we're going to send into the chat and anybody who has any questions about it can ask me um, after the class about how to become a member. Okay. And now I'd like to introduce Janice and she's going to talk a little bit about who she is. Thank okay. you, ma'am. Well, thanks for having me. Um, when we moved here from Chicago, which was 25 years ago, I realized that I was coming into a different landscape. Mm -hmm. And there was on PBS, the um, special on Mulholland and the water situation in California and coming from the Great Lakes, I thought, well, my goodness, you know, I, what goes on here? And why are there green lawns and water fountains everywhere and swimming pools? Um, and so slowly, um, I had my third child and, um, once, you know, one got out of diapers, I had a little bit more time to garden and, um, get to know the plants that were in our yard. Uh, luckily we had a native oak. So, um, that was something that I, I wouldn't even, even recognize because the oaks in California look so different from back East. Do we have any people here who grew up back East? Yeah, so right, we, I have even friends who've lived here a long time that didn't know that that was a California oak tree because they're not used to seeing an oak that way. At any rate, I am not a scientist, but I am a master gardener and have been a native plant enthusiast and I'm very big on researching things because um, I like to do that. Uh, I think that the scholarship is very important and our role as a master gardener is to connect you um, with all of the vast, not all of it, because we don't, you know, there's so much of research that goes on at the University of California, but we are like a conduit between the system and what goes on and helping you in your home gardens. Um, there's a, actually another arm of the master gardener that ha helps commercial nurseries and farms. And we are more geared to the, um, the home gardener. So um, we'll be talking about that. Um, and what a lot of people don't know is that we, our state is a biodiversity hotspot. We are the only state in the union that is a biodiversity hotspot. And, and that is because of the different um, climate, the different microclimates, the different topography that we have. I mean, especially for us in Santa Cruz, we have from the redwoods to the ocean, I mean, there's not that many, this is a special place, as you know, for all of us that live here, that we get to experience all of this. And so our state has around 7,000 species of plants. That is way more than any other state in the union. Um, and even right here on the central coast, there's well over a thousand. As another example of this, I ask people, do you know how many native bees we have? Bees native to California, 1,400, around 1,400, give or take. Well, in the country, in the United States, it's maybe approximately 4,000. So if we have 1,400 just in California, 
that's a lot. Um, so, you know, our diversity is not just in plants, but it's also in animals and also in insects and also along our coast. A lot of people don't know that we actually have a, a big variety of seaweed, of sea vegetables, which were in the past important food. Next slide, please. Okay, so native plants, we have, there are many benefits of gardening with native plants. Um, because over thousands of years, they've been adapted to our soil um, and adapted to our weather. Um, we have very dry summers, as you know, and our rain only comes in the winter months and actually only comes in a few months. And with climate change, it's not even really what we could consider to be reliable rain, right? Um, we had in October, we had no rain. And that typically on average, we would have some rain, but um, the weather has become more volatile uh, and we're all seeing it and feeling it um, here in the state of California, as well as the rest of the country. Now, Native plants have been co-evolving with our native insects over thousands of years. So they have these symbiotic relationships. And um, we think, oh, you know, Mediterranean plants have been, they, they have a similar climate to ours, et cetera. But um, a lot of insects are very host specific. And so they, they actually cannot use that plant as a host plant. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on. But also as far as erosion control, one of the adaptations of native plants is to have very deep root systems. The root system of a native grass is so much deeper or our native oaks is much deeper than oaks in the rest of the country that it's, there's a lot going on underneath the soil that you don't see that's sequestering carbon as well. So these are, it's important for us to um, support those populations just for that reason. And also because they are adapted to our soils, unlike a lot of our cultivated crops and other plants from other areas, you don't, you really don't need to be adding all kinds of amendments, fertilizers and that kind of thing. You will find that gardening with native plants really reduces the amount of inputs that you have to give. Um, next slide. So I mentioned before, we have on the central coast here, around 1500 native plant species. And that includes a number uh, that are rare that only occur in Santa Cruz County. And who can name one? The tar plant? Which tar plant? We have like dozens. Okay, the Santa Cruz tar plant, the Santa Cruz tar plant. <laughs> okay, and, and also the Santa Cruz manzanita. We'll talk about that a little while later. Um, but actually a number of plants that don't occur anywhere else, even our banana slug species, right? It has a very small range. It is not throughout the entire state, our particular banana slug. It's even a different banana slug up in San Francisco. You know, it's a slightly different species. Um, so part of the reason why we have all this biodiversity in our little area is because we have all of these different plant communities. And um, there are too many to name. Uh, these are just a few that I've mentioned here, coastal prairie, the redwoods we know, right? And who's aware of our sand hills? Okay, great, because that's like a special area. And this website that I list here, our Native Plant Society, the chapter, Santa Cruz chapter, if you do go on this link, they will go, they have a very nice, and on the next slide, I'm going to show you where you will get to if you click on to that and go on that website, a description of these plant communities so you don't have to write anything down. You can go there and read about it. They, they do a very nice job. Uh, one of the first plant communities that they talk about mm -hmm. that comes up on the website is our grassland or our coastal prairies. Now the coastal prairie in particular is one that is 
highly threatened and endangered at overall in Santa Cruz County. Um, we have through development, through, through um, agriculture, um, we are, have only fragmented pieces of coastal prairie left in our county, but one of the best pieces of that coastal prairie is right here on campus. Who knows what I'm talking about? Marshall Field in Upper Campus, and part of our UC Santa Cruz Natural Preserve is a stupendous area. And um, it is great to go up there every spring uh, or actually all year, but to see some of the very special plants that reside there. Next slide. I'm just going to, um, oh, this book, which I have a copy of right here. The Natural History of UC Santa Cruz. Has everybody read this? <laughs> Who's read this book? Okay, well, this is your homework because <laughs> This is where you can learn all about this wonderful, fabulous campus. And in it, they'll talk about the, um, the, the, the plant communities that are right here on campus. And we have many. I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. So um, I have a copy of this book that I can pass around just to take a glance because it's chock full of information. That's just in, it's in its second edition. Okay. Um, of course, on campus, the soils have been studied in great detail. Why? Because we're a university. <laughs> and so we benefit from that. There, just to give you an idea of the variance in soils that we have throughout the state, there are 27 different kinds of soils just on UCSC campus. And this is also leads to, you know, plants and soil, right? This also is connected with the kind of biodiversity we have. And, and that soil, we have a geologist in the crowd here who can explain further about how soils are formed, but the underlying bedrock, right? and we different types of rock, and then the different types of plants, and the different topography and erosion. And over time, we have different kinds of soils that are developed. Now, what's kind of just interesting uh, for, for you, UC Davis put together an app, and I have a website listed on this page that uh, you can just Google, you don't have to write this down. If you just Google UC Davis soil resource, you can go to that website, next slide please, and you can put in your home address. And you, in, in this case, I put in UCSC and you get a soil map and all these different areas are, the soil is changing. Now look at that, isn't that something? How even on your own property, the soil might change from one place to the other. I have seen, depending on where the boundaries are, across the street might have as a different soil from you. So this is just being aware of that because that's why people say, well, this plant, it didn't live in my, it didn't live in my house, you know, it didn't, it didn't like it. Well, could be that it didn't, it wasn't as happy with that particular soil. That could be one reason, okay? Is this all, is this found all from sampling? Yeah, oh, the US Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. did major sampling for many, many, many years. And so this data comes from them, yes, yeah. And it's all public information, you know. But the, the this UC Davis app just makes it easier for you to type in your address and you get right there. It's really fun to take a look. And they, this, these soils, they have all these names, like here, what is it? 85% of this is Elkhorn, whatever that is. Um, you know, I don't know, I'm not a soil scientist, but um, if you click on the map, you'll click on, you'll be able to see, well, what is that soil? And it gives you the composition right there. And it's really kind of, it's just fun. It's kind of cool that we at the UC have this access to this kind of information and this work was done for us. Um, it's UC Davis soil resource. You just, yeah, you can, 
get there right there. Um, next slide, please. So these, I just, I had to show you some of these plants if you've not been up in Marshall Field in the spring that we have up there. Um, the, the harlequin lotus is, which is in the uh, pea family, by the way, um, is, isn't that delightful? And our Fremont star lily, hopefully if you've been hiking, you've run into these plants in the spring, not just here on campus, but in other places. Next slide. I'm only gonna show you a few because you know there's too many. Um, there's, there's a really cool sack clover there and our checker bloom uh, in the spring next. We're gonna kind of whiz through these blue, our blue-eyed grass, which is by the way, not a grass. It's in the iris family um, and fairly widespread, really beautiful, really easy to grow at home. I highly recommend it. And, and because it's not that big, it's nice for edging. Uh, it works well in the shade and the sun. It's a very easy plant to grow. And a really neat one up there is this coyote thistle, which is in the carrot family. <laughs> yeah, it's a carrot family plant. And we've got loads of it up in Marshall Field. And it is pokey. Uh, our matum, you can get poked by it, so don't sit on it. Um, it's also been called, I think it's another nickname is button celery. I'm not sure what parts of it might be edible, but avoid the avoid the 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 pointy parts. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and then one more that I want to mention is Yampa. That's the the um, native name, and um, this is in also in the carrot family and has a a nutritious root. Um, we also have a, a terrific population of this plant that we're trying to save in the Poganip in the meadow. And um, wouldn't it be nice if we could really bring back this population of this important native food? Yampa. Okay. So really, uh, we have really not fully utilized native plants in our, in our urban landscapes around our homes. And We've just talked about how well adapted they are and how easy they are to grow, um, but that just hasn't been done. Now, part of, as part of the bee program out of Berkeley, they did a survey of the plants that people have grown in front yards. And so, okay, look, great. Uh, they found a thousand different things, but out of those only 50 were native. And I think that if we were to survey uh, Santa Cruz today, we might find a similar set of numbers. And that's like, you know, what, what is, who, who can do the math? That's like 5% maybe only uh, of what we could have. So the coverage uh, for native plants has really been reduced and reduced and reduced and reduced over the years. And yet what they found is that those native plants attracted 80% of the different bees that they found. And those are for the reasons that we talked about before, because of the co-involvement. So even in your yard, you could, in fact, support a lot of native pollinators. And we've done that at our Master Gardener Demo Garden by including native plants. And we immediately, they find it, they find them. And it's just amazing to see. Next, please. Um, so, Weeds. Who doesn't have weeds in their yard? Who has no weeds? <laughs> well, you know, from the beginning of, of European, uh, you know, coming over uh, to California, and then maybe at the, in the early days, and I'm talking maybe in the 1700s, maybe there were a dozen, 15 kinds of weeds, but I, I just read a history of the weeds in California. By the end of the gold rush, there were uh, close to 200 kinds of weeds. And today there are well over a thousand different kinds of noxious weeds, weeds and many being extremely noxious that we are now dealing with um, and have invaded our native landscape and reduced our coverage of native plants even more. So uh, the weed management area of Santa Cruz, 
Uh, and I think with the land trust or so on, they put together this document, which is available online with some of the worst weeds in Santa Cruz County. Who knows about broom? Who's heard about broom? Invasive, highly invasive, highly invasive to the point that they um, they depress or smother our native species. I've also heard them referred to as our displaced brothers and sisters. <laughs> True. Yeah. I mean, I, I like eucalyptus. I like it in Australia. <laughs> you know, I like it there. It's great there. Oxalis. Anybody familiar with Oxalis? The next slide, please. I think I have a picture of Oxalis. Um, you know, it's important to know your weed so that you can then figure out the most effective way of removal. And, and this becomes very important when we come to our most pernicious persisting weeds. Oxalis is one of those, right? Oxalis because um, it produces these little bulblets that are so sneaky that as soon as you pull that weed, it detaches from the bulbs. So the bulbs are still there. So you have not gotten rid of that plant. You can get rid of this plant, but you must starve it for maybe three years or maybe five years. You can get rid of it. Um, uh, not only should you pull it, but uh, if, if, and the UCs have done research on this, if you can keep it away from light for like three years, so it has no sunlight, so it can't photosynthesize, you can get rid of it. <laughs> so, uh, and I would suggest to, if you do have this, that you start on it like now, okay? Because uh, the oxalis is all growing right now with that little bit of rain, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's very interesting. This is a, a recent weed book, and I must mention, because I just love this weed book, it came out in 2018. Uh, Richard Orlando was the lead gardener at UC Berkeley for many years, so he dealt with these weeds, and he ended up learning so much about them that he taught weed courses <laughs> as well, and something sneaky that happened. Now, in Oxalis in South Africa is not a weed. He thinks that what happened here, there was some kind of genetic mutation where, because the seed here is not viable, the seed in South Africa still is viable. So somehow it mutated and became this monster oxalis that, that, that ramped up its vegetative prop, propagation abilities and has become a, a monster. A little monster weed. But anyway, I highly recommend um, this book, see, because what he says is it's weeds in the urban landscape, where they come from, why they're here, and how to live with them. Because in many cases, we are not going to eradicate these weeds. We're just going to have to get them to reduce to levels so that they are not harming the environment to the extent that they are. It's like the genies out of the bottle, right? And every year with globalization, we have new weeds coming in. So, um, and there's maybe no stopping that, right? And, and you, it's not just the plant weeds, it's also viruses, it's also funguses it's, that are coming in as well. We had a new Phytophthora fungus that came in and invaded our woods and are killing part of our forest. Um, uh, you've heard of the um, Dutch Elden disease? Dutch Elden disease, which just decimated the elm population in the United States or the chestnut blight, right? Which just wiped out millions, tens of millions of chestnut trees that we used to have in this country. Um, uh, so, Things like that um, are here. We're right now, the master gardeners are watching up for the emerald, the emerald ash borer and the, um, uh, there's a Chinese psyllid from the citrus trees that could come in. I, I don't have the details on that, but you know, we're on the watch for those kinds of things and where they're moving. Um, 
Okay, how to get rid of, I wanna talk about this because there are a number of native plants, especially our wildflowers that really struggle with the weeds. They have a very difficult time competing with the weeds. So if you're going to grow native plants, you must try to reduce the amount of weeds that you have. And one of the ways that we did it very successfully at our master gardener, which was, we had a plot and Candace is a fellow master gardener. She was there helping. Um, we, we had an area that was 90 some odd percent, just all weeds and we sheet mulched it. We did layers of cardboard that we got from Costco. We watered that well. Um, and, this, and this was by the way, a, after the first rains had come. So the first set of weeds have sprouted. This is, that's a good time mm -hmm. to do that, you know, uh, because some of that, some of that, and we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to like remove all those weeds. We just put the cardboard right on top. So it's shut out from sunlight. And then we dumped a bunch of mulch that we got free from Lewis Tree and from um, one of the other tree companies, yeah, Davy Tree, right? That came and you know there there are tree landscapers, or tree uh, pruners, and so on. They want to get rid of the stuff. So, um, in fact, I think Lewis Tree. If you you can go there, they're down on Brammer, I think, uh, and you can call them first, and you can go there. And you have to like load up your car yourself, okay, uh, and car. Their, they'll take their dumper and dump it in the back of your Oh, they'll help you? Yeah. Well, that's, oh, well, that's probably because you were very polite and nice to them. So <laughs> it's like, okay, so, but so yeah, if you can get that kind of help, that's really nice. And then sometimes some will, you know, come in and actually drop it. They dropped it off at our demo garden. So that was really nice. 15 yards of it, which we needed. Yeah, so, um, uh, so that's one way. Other another way is once the rains have come, the weed seed have germinated, mow then at least. And and definitely don't let these things go to seed because a lot of our the annual weeds do propagate themselves by producing copious amounts of seeds. The, you know, and it's not just dandelions, right? It's like there's a whole host of urban weeds that we have. So um one, it's good to identify your weeds. Is it a weed? You know, you, you wanna make sure because um, everybody doesn't know what weeds they have, right? Uh, the Master Gardeners do have um, a little app thing on, the, on our website where it's kind of a weed ID. And, you know, they ask you, you go through some questions to try to narrow it down and figure out what kind of weed you have. But I actually, for, for urban gardens, I really like this book because this was written specifically more for urban gardens and not for like habitat restoration or not necessarily for farms. There are books for those, you know, like if you have a small farm, um, there are ones that are more geared towards agricultural situations, but this is gonna cover most of the weeds that we have at home. And I'm really glad that this book came out. Okay, next slide, please. Um, how do you find, how do you choose native plants? Well, the most important thing about that is that you want to choose your most local native plant because we've got 7,000, but that doesn't mean that you can plant a Joshua tree, okay? <laughs> and, and, and for people in the desert, that doesn't mean that they can grow a redwood. We here on the Central Coast, you want to stick with Central Coast plants and you want to find, figure out what plants are native to your house. And luckily, and this was not available when I started gardening, we have recently, the, the Native Plant Society has developed this app called Calscape. So if you type in Calscape, you will get to their website and you can put in your address. And next slide, please. You will then come up with, I put in the UCSC farm. I don't know if you can see that pretty well on the slide there, but look at what it came up with, 536 plants. That's a lot, 
native to just the farm. And it, at your house, it might come up with 856 or so, seriously. So what they've done is if you look closely, they've got categories. And the category at the bottom right, I highly recommend. What is that category? Can anybody read it? It says, very easy. <laughs> These are some of the very easiest native, locally native species of plants. And I think that's a good place to start. If you have not gardened with native plants before, what they mean by very easy is they mean that these are species that they know are adapted to a wide range of soils and a wide range of sun and shade and a wide range of watering little to you know somebody who's watered maybe too much right because it, it takes time to figure all these things out over time so that's a great place to start because while it's not foolproof it really increases your chances of success with those plants. So, and, and look at the number um, got reduced to 81 species. That's doable, right? And some of those species, it might be a tree, you might not want to plant another tree. So it's like, you know, once you look at it, then within there, you're going to get to some really terrific choices. And we're gonna talk about a few of them. Um, but also when you're looking at that list, you want to think about how the land around your house changes. Um, because of our buildings, you're gonna probably have some areas with shade, right? Next to your house. You are probably gonna have, you might have a really sunny place. You might have existing trees that, that change the sunlight around your house. And if you've lived there for a while, you've watched it. So like, you know where you're hot, places are right where you might have wanted to plant tomatoes before and then you know where you're you might have a deep shady place or a seasonally wet place from the rain coming off your gutters that creates kind of a wet spot well guess what california has seasonal wet places called vernal pools and so a species that mimics that in the wild would be perfect i have a friend who um off her gutter um the water kind of pools and makes a mini little vernal pool. And so our meadow foam is what she has. And that has just naturally increased over the years because that's what it wants. It wants that seasonal wetness. You know, you know how our streams and our creeks might fill up when it rains, right? We have that, we have that change that happens and we have areas that are depressed and we have um, we have areas on campus here called the seeps and you take a hike. The, has anybody gone on our, uh, the, 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 um, what is that hike called? It starts right off of, and it's got signage for you. Yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's a hike that, I, okay, off the top of my head, I'm forgetting the name of that hike, but just, just on the other side of Baskin Engineering, there's the beginning of a trailhead with interpretive uh, signage that is in need of repair. I have to admit the last time I saw it, some of these signs had fallen off, but some of the signs are still there and it's a nice guided hike, self-guided hike that you can take that explains um, some of what we're talking about here. So, you know, use your good judgment, right? You're all smart people. So, you know, it, so, <laughs> You'll you kind of have a sense of no this this plant might work here or and and then think about the size that that plant ends up becoming and all of that information is right on the Calscape page because then once they give you that list of plants that allows you to just click and get all this information on that particular plant with how it grows what it likes and even companions that it likes and the various insects native pollinators that it supports. It's full of information and it's just a wonderful tool to have. It's fun later on, I, you know, you'll go home and go on that website and play around with it this, this afternoon, okay? <laughs> That's your homework, <laughs> number two, okay. Um, okay, now some of these plants, something to consider, 
are called keystone plants. Has anybody um, heard of Doug Tallamy and his book, Nature's Best Hope? Yeah, some of you have. Okay, but some of you have, and he is an entomologist um, and he's been studying these relationships of native plants and native insects. And it's been very eye-opening to a lot of people because we didn't consider just how much our native insects and native pollinators need the native plants. I think probably the most well-known is monarch butterfly, right? We know that it needs milkweed, otherwise the milkweed is its host plant. So here we're talking about host plants. And if you know the story of the very hungry caterpillar <laughs> who eats a nice green leaf, the larva of a lot of insects gets laid on a leaf and the insect is eating the leaf, right? So we're not talking about nectar. Nectars from a lot of plants are largely sugar waters and sugar waters don't vary as much. The chemistry in a leaf is very different and we know all about that because we know how the chemistry varies in different cannabis plants, right? It can vary a lot. This one has more THC and this one has more CBD. So the same with our native plants. There's a different chemistry in the leaf, different compounds that we get a lot of our medicines from, right? Like digitalis, right? And so on. Many, 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 many. There's a compound in there. Aspirin from willow. Aspirin, salix, salicylic acid. That's where that comes from. All right. So um, because insects are, are really near the bottom in our food chain, supporting the plants and the insects are supporting everything. So if we are not supporting from the ground up, you know, and having healthy soils, we're sickening our earth which is exactly what we are doing, right? Because we, we dump a lot of pesticides and chemicals in addition to how we have converted land into different uses that do not support plants. Um, and you know what we're learning is that it's a very, very high percentage of insects that are specialists. They can't just live on any plant. They can't have their babies re procreate on any, any plant. So for example, Budleia has always people in the trade and at nurseries, oh, I, you know, I'd like to plant for butterflies. Oh, we've got Budleia, right? Every, a lot of people have heard about that. But what have we found out? There is not a single North American butterfly that can use it as a host plant. So that's how it is. <laughs> All right, next slide. Um, I just love this picture because an oak tree is a keystone species and oak tree and our native oak trees are, they're, they're like superheroes. The amount of life that they support is enormous. So if you have room to plant an oak, and there's been a lot of oaks planted on campus. There's been a very active oak planting program here, which is wonderful. You, you, when you walk around camp, you'll see some that have been caged to protect them from all the deer that we have, right? And so on, and when they're young. And so this is marvelous. And um, just to give you an idea, a little bit more about our native oaks, an appreciation, I've got a little card here. And um, the valley oak has the biggest acorns. And I don't, even though it's depicted here, I don't, I have some actual valley oak acorns. I didn't think that, you know, the, this did it justice, but just take a look because for the oaks in our area, we pass this down. Okay. Give you an idea of our native oaks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hi. You needed to be here. Okay, next. <laughs> next slide. Thanks. Um, local ceanothus is our blue blossom, which we have blue blossom pretty much everywhere. When you're out hiking, you see that big blue. It's usually it's blue blossom. Um, and, um, and we've got some great ones on campus. Toyan is a very widespread shrub um, that is easy to grow, uh, very adaptable to lots of conditions. 
and just beautiful. It's one of my favorites. And the berries tend to uh, be become all red around Christmas time, around the holidays. So I use it for holiday decorations uh, and so on. I love it so much I planted nine, <laughs> this big shrub. Um, next slide. Manzanitas. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about manzanitas because we have many special manzanitas that are endemic to this area. And one of the best places to see them is right at our UCSC Arboretum, where the Santa Cruz Manzanita, which is Arctostaphylus andersoni, we have a most amazing, massive um, Santa Cruz Manzanita in the conservation area um, and, and in our native garden. Um, and Linda Anderson is here, who's in charge of the native plant group at the Arboretum and, and runs our volunteer program for on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you're most welcome to join. And this is a great way, if you're interested in learning about native plants, join the Tuesday or Thursday group, because that's a great way to learn about the plants, because we have a botanic garden with native plants. So <laughs> we're lucky right here. And it's fabulous. Fabulous. Um, ground covers are always, people ask this question all the time. Well, what can I use as a ground cover? And we have many, many choices. These are just a couple of local uh, species that I like a lot. Uh, the first one is, oh, that's, that slide was supposed to be corrected. But anyway, the first one is California sagebrush. When you read anything in literature, even of the California sagebrush, that's this plant. It's nicknamed cowboy cologne because it smells so good that the cowboys would take pieces of it and rub it all over themselves. And you know, that's something that we like to do too today. And we're not cowboys. The gum plant is, is a, uh, we have, I think, I forget how many species of gum plant we have. We have, I think half a dozen or at least four. And on campus up in, up in Marshall Field, we have Grindelia camporum. The gum plant I like a lot uh, because the gummy residue is the active ingredient in Technu soap. If you get poison oak, rash, that's where it comes from. So it was used for that purpose too, as an anti-itch. Uh, but the gum was also used as a glue um, and it makes a nice ground cover. We have a form that's very low, Grindelia stricta platyphylla, that's nice and low and makes a wonderful ground cover and as listed in the bee book that we showed earlier, it is one of the top bee plants as well. And it stays in bloom like for, I don't know, really long time, like maybe three quarters of a year. So you have blooms. No, I don't think it does. I don't think it does, but for some reason, Well, we have a lot of, um, in, this is in the daisy family. And you know, the daisy family is one of the biggest families like in the world, right? And there are a lot of, of plants in the daisy family that are yellow and um, are daisy looking like, you know, um, and do have great scent. Like our tar plants, I think have a really nice scent. So, and it's sticky. That's why it's called tar plant. So it could have been that. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell which plant it is because we have so many. Yeah. You'd have to like maybe take a really good picture of it and, um, you know, in focus and, and um, so that we can identify it or a sample. Okay. Because there's so many. There's so, so, so many. And it's easy to get them confused. Yeah. Um, a couple of other nice ground covers, hummingbird sage with a terrific scent. And I, I just, and, and seaside daisy, these are very, very local and um, a nice size for a smaller garden. Next slide. Um, our coast buckwheat is super important. That's our local buckwheat is coast buckwheat. And um, next slide. It stays in bloom a long time too. And it, this is at the Santa Cruz Natural History Museum. And I wanted to show this because they had gotten a grant and they took out the lawn that had been lawn not too long ago. 
and sheet mulched it and replanted it with native plants. And along the front edge of that curb is seaside daisy that we just showed. And, 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 um, and then within there are the coast buckwheat that we mentioned, our poppies, our other uh, California buttercup. And if you can see in the back by the, by the door to the left of the museum, that was where I got that picture of the hummingbird sage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right there at the, it's doing very nicely there. It grows by underground roots as well, so it spreads. And it's just so easy care. All you need is one plant, just buy one plant. And eventually over a few years, you'll have that nice patch. And I've seen, I have seen people in Santa Cruz use it uh, as a ground cover um, in my neighborhood and stuff like that. It's really nice and really smells good. And the hummingbirds, it's called hummingbird sage. These hummingbirds, they go crazy for it. They really do. You plant that, you will have hummingbirds, hands down. Um, okay, our wild flowers. California is known for the most gorgeous wildflowers, right? I mean, people drive to go to Carrizo Plain or something to see wildflowers, but you know what? You could have wildflowers in your front yard. Why do you think you can't? You can. Um, Baby Blue Eyes is a local one and uh, Clarkia, the wine cup Clarkia, which ends up being a small mounding and the flowers, they're big, they're beautiful. Um, we've had it at, these are pictures from our demo garden where we put them in and you can certainly do the same. We have many wildflowers to choose from and they're easy to grow from seed. They're not hard to do, but you just need to have controlled your weeds. Okay, they do struggle. If you have weeds, they struggle with that. Next slide. Um, now the buttercup is not an annual wildflower. It's a perennial wildflower, but it's pretty widespread here, widespread on campus. And I mention it because it was also a very important seed food, like buttercup panole. Um, was made with it. And it, it is also very beautiful and very easy to grow. Desert bluebells is from the desert, but I mention it because it's so beautiful. Who, you know, to have that bright blue flower, a super great bee plant. And you can go to most of the nurseries here and get a packet of seed. They have it. Mm -hmm. I've just bought it at like San Lorenzo or, uh, or the garden company in the neighborhood here. Lupins, of course, right? You've experienced our lupins, I hope. And remember, the lupins are in the pea family. So they're nitrogen fixers. And we're gonna remember that, right? Mm -hmm. That we have all these lupins that are nitrogen fixers, okay? Um, because one of, the, one of the uses in a farm situation, how many people here are having a small farm situation? Okay, so you've heard of hedgerows. The UC system has a ton of information on hedgerows. They've done all kinds of studies on hedgerows and have one of this infographic is, and this website will take you to a whole host of hedgerow, um, hedgerow uh, information to help you plant a hedgerow. So. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about that because it depends on your situation, but it, it's um, a, a lot of great research has been done on that and easily accessible because they put it together for you to easily understand and install if you have that kind of a situation or somebody that has just a big property, right? That borders on the wildlife urban interface or something like that and has the room to put in a hedgerow. Elderberries, are something that are underplanted, but so easy to grow, very native. And the UCs have recently put together new documents on um, the commercial aspects of elderberries because elderberries are very popular. You can find herbal elderberry products at the stores. You know, those manufacturers are mostly importing elderberry. Whereas it's native to California, we could grow it. We don't have to buy it from somebody else. So they recently put together this information on the UCANR site. 
And I, I don't know if they have elderberry here at the farm. Does anybody know? But that would be something that could easily, easily grow. And elderberry wine is also very popular, right? Okay, um, cover cropping is another way that we can incorporate in a farm. Traditional cover crops today are of non-native um, species in those mixes. And um, as I, like I mentioned, lupins and other um, nitrogen fixing native plants that we have, the, the UCs are starting to look to it because if you look closely what this, what they say when you come to the UCs information on is they say um, that please note that these species have never been previously used as cover crops. And basically we need more information on this. And so we do have some small farms in the area that are starting to test this out because these non-native uh, pea family plants in particular, they require a lot of water to plant that cover crop. And we don't have a lot of water. Why not plant a native nitrogen fixing species that doesn't require the same amount of water? Okay, so these are things that we need to continue to test out and there's no better place for doing that than here at the farm, yeah. Oh, next slide, we can get to that. Um, so in addition to our lupins, we have, we are rich in clovers and vetches um, and included in cover crops too tend to be other plants like our native grasses and bulbs as well in the mix. It's not just nitrogen fixers. They include native, they include right now non-native grasses. A lot of times in these cover crop mixes, I've seen a vena sativa, which is a non-native uh, oak grass. Um, and it has become a major problem in our grasslands, in our coastal prairie. It's invaded and out competing our native grasses. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Um, clovers, even on campus, we have um, a number of native clovers. We showed you one before, the sack clover. I don't know if you recall that, but there was one before, but there are others. Oh, next slide. Um, Phacelia, our native Phacelia wildflower has been used in Europe as a cover crop for decades. And, and we do have a number of organic gardeners in California who are using it, who are. And they tried it out here at the farm last year. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's, it's one of the best. Um, yay. Oh, and we have seed for you today. Uh, we have some Facilia seed for you to take home. So be sure to stop and get a little, you only need a little, a little goes a long way. And so you can try that out. Um, and I just wanna talk a little bit about the fact that our indigenous people, they got everything they needed from native plants, you know, and from the native landscape, you know, um, and a large part of their diet was from the plants. And it's not about acorns. Uh, and here on the coast, a large part of their diet was seeds, different seeds um, and, and these other foods and a lot of different native grass seed because what is local here is California oat grass, California wild rye, California barley, <laughs> meadow barley. You know, those are what's native and local here that are very important components of our native grasslands. And um, those are your grains, right? So it all makes sense that they would collect those seeds. And then there were, there were maybe we can go to the next slide, I think. Um, in for the Amamudsen, Madia sativa, the coast tarweed, and, and, and um, we don't see the flower open here. It's got a daisy flower, but uh, this picture has the seeds, a picture of the seeds inside the, the capsule. 
and they collected a lot of that seed. It is, uh, that was a very, very important seed food for our local tribe. Oh, I have a sample of that. Thank you. I can't show this camera. Well, it's gonna be hard for people to see this, <laughs> but um, this is already in fact, because we had a party um, with the Amamuts and Land Trust, and, and this is toasted and ready to be eaten, sprinkled on foods. And you can pass that around. Is it sweet like sativa? Like sativa? You know, I, I actually didn't think it had that much flavor, but I know that it's nutritious and they would have lots of it, you know, volumes of it. Um, one of the most widespread seed foods that you guys probably are aware of is chia, right? Mm -hmm. That, and this map shows where chia was eaten in California, and it covers a very wide area. The, the chia you're buying at the store is not our California chia. There's lots of different chias. There's lots. Um, our chia is salvia columbariae, and you can plant that. It's an annual wildflower, and it grows easily from seed, which can also be eaten. So that's salvia columbariae, columbariae. Um, so it's something to think about, and so it's, a, it's, a salvia. it's a salvia, yeah, it's an annual salvia. It's not that big a plant. I think we've got, do we have some that are growing out there? No, okay. Do you know the name of the name of that? Is it the father? Oh, well, no, because there were so many different tribes and they all had different names. And I do not know the Amamuta name. I didn't come across that one, so I don't know. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit, we've talked a lot about our grasslands, but people don't realize that they have been uh, destroyed by 99%, our native grasslands in the state of California. And they are um, very important plants. They're, they were widespread and their root systems would have sequestered a lot of carbon, you know, uh, and held held the soil, and were very important components of the whole ecosystem, um, providing habitat for a lot of animals. So we just, I just want to raise awareness for that, and we have a number of these grasses in the native garden at the arboretum that you can come and see. We have a lot of beautiful examples of native grasses there, and we're adding more every year. And this is part, a large part of what the, the coastal restoration for the Amamutsin, which is happening in Anio Nuevo and in other spots. Uh, Watson Will Wetlands is also working on this, uh, is to restore our grasslands. And it is probably one of the most difficult types of habitats to restore because of the pressure from the weeds that we now have, the non-native grasses, which are very hard for them to compete against and very difficult to remove, requiring lots and lots of labor because we're not using chemicals, right? So you say the Watsonville wetlands. Yeah. They're working on it. Does it mean that the grasses are best? In... No, the, uh, they're different coastal prairies, that's a, a coastal prairie situation over there. No, they're, no, we have different kinds of grasslands, but they they do all have similar, here on this coastal prairie, they have similar components. The California oak grass, California wild rye, um, our, who knows our state grass? Who knows the state grass? Who knows that we have a state grass? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, purple needle grass, stipopulchra, which is which was a widespread grass. We have a native grass, a state grass. Okay, we have a state grass. It's purple needle grass. It's stipopulchra. Who knows that we have a state fabric? We do. We're hey, we're cool Californians. It's denim. Yeah. <laughs> For real, you can look it up. Okay, we have state. Who knows our state tree? You know this, huh? Thank you. We actually have, who knows that we have two state trees? 
Okay, we have two. I'm gonna let you look that up yourself. Okay, we're done with fourth grade. Now, the clovers, this, I just wanted, this is a picture of probably our most widespread clover is tomcat clover. And we've got tomcat clover here on campus. So go find it in the spring. Um, and I just wanna to say too, that the clovers were important greens for foods. And wouldn't it be great if we could bring back that native green in the clovers? Um, you're familiar with this one, right? Also a native, yeah, also a native tasty green. And um, I think we have like eight different species of this in Santa Cruz County. Did you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we have biodiversity here. Um, and this was a favorite. Not only is it gorgeous, is it beautiful, it's very, but this was a highly prized seed food. And um, in the project for the Amutsen, they luckily found five plants mm -hmm. and they collected seed and now we have a whole row. So we're amplifying it and bringing it back. There is a good population of this at Quail Hollow. In the spring, you can go see it. It's in the apple orchard. And I'm not, who, who knows where are, there are other local populations of this that they've seen, yeah? I've seen it at the walking in the, in the rainforest. Yeah, it's at the um, Glenwood Preserve as well. I've seen it there. Um, and just, I'm gonna, these are pictures that I took uh, in Marshall Field. Some of our many bulbs, our beautiful bulbs. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, these were important mm -hmm. foods. Um, they, the Western people called them Indian potatoes because they saw them digging up, digging these bulbs and corms up by the shovelful and eating them. And wouldn't that be great? We can go through the next one. I'm just gonna show you five different ones that are up in Marshall Field. This is Pretty Faces. This is our Mariposa Lilies. Um, we have another kind of Mariposa Lily that I, I took up there, you know, and um, another, uh, the a, a really low growing Brodier. And um, wouldn't it be great if we could bring back those populations to where you could dig them up by the shovelful as in the past and have that as a food? Um, this is actually madrone. Madrone berries are edible too, as well as manzanita berries. We have a lot of native berries, including somebody brought to share today some thimble berry. For real, thimble berry plants are back there. Um, um, strawberries we know about because we grow a lot of strawberries in the area. Our, our, and our native strawberries make a really nice ground cover too. And, and they they need almost nothing to grow. You know, once you put them in, they'll start, you know, because of the runners, right? They'll just spread and make a really attractive ground cover. Um, and our beach strawberry is actually the stock with which all of these cultivated strawberries come from. They use that as the rootstock. Um, elderberry, we mentioned madrone berries, and of course, grapes, we have native grapes. Hello, wine. You're all right. Wine <laughs> grapes are native to California. And so they grow really well here. Um, and we have different kinds of native grapes. The nuts, nuts, uh, walnuts. Who doesn't love walnuts? Okay. Well, um, and we could do more. You could have a walnut tree. Um, the walnuts are native? We have native walnut. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and at UC Davis, where they have now some squirrels are native. We have a lot of non native squirrels too that have invaded, but we have native squirrels as well. Yeah. Yeah, we see them more. Yeah. They are. They tend to be ground squirrels. Um, we have sequestered the genome of walnut trees. And so there is a lot of research that's been going on 
uh, on what are some of the best walnuts for us to plant. But of course, a native walnut, you can plant a native walnut. It does like water. So we tend to find them more if you live near a riparian area, that makes more sense. And as far as bay laurel, we've got a lot of great bay laurel, right? Even a few steps away, you know, from here. That I think it was mentioned that the students here have taken the bay laurel nuts, which is, by the way, bay laurel is a relative of avocado. So when you look at the bay laurel, it looks a little bit like a mini avocado, doesn't it? Yeah, it's in that plant family. Um, and they've been roasted and eaten as well, too. So, so there, there are these various native foods that you might not always be thinking about as a food. Um, but outside of those uses, like as a hedgerow or cover cropper, I think the bigger lesson for us is the relationship that the native people had with their plants. And it was one of reciprocity. They were not thinking about it as, what can these plants give to me? But also, how am I taking care of them and Mother Earth in general and all the things that it supports? And so it's also about giving back. It's not about extracting like we do when we're planting a monoculture, right? And then just like trying to take all of it or whatever, that's never what they did. With a, when, when they harvested, it was never taking the first, never taking the last. And it was also making sure that progeny would be there so that it would regenerate for the future. And in fact, so that these populations would increase. And part of the reason why we've seen such a decline is because when they were taken away from their lands, those practices were not allowed, were no longer allowed. And so what happened? We just have seen those, now these clovers, these native clovers, a lot of them are threatened and endangered now. They're on our, they have rare plant rankings now. Our bulbs, our beautiful bulbs, there are a number of them that have rare plant rankings now, which is maybe why you haven't seen them all, unless you're looking, right? But this spring, get up to Marshall Field and there's a good chance that you'll see some because they still live there. And it's great that the university does its part to take care of it. And at the Arboretum with the rare plant program in seed banking, these rare species, and a number, of rare, a number of rare species recently were planted down by those, you know, the domes at the Arb where there was that experimental. Get over there this spring, be sure, and see that too. Because just a few yards away, we have all of this conservation going on. It's right across the fence. And that's about all I have to say. Um, oh, I, keep going, oh yeah. Okay, what are we, there's resources. There are a number of resources that are coming later on uh, on these slides so that you don't have to write everything down. Um, and including, there's a, a couple of YouTubes that I wanna mention uh, because our Rick Flores from the ARB recently did a talk with the Native Plant Society of Santa Clara talking about the Amamutsin and what's been going on lately. And it is a wonderful talk. And if you want more details, he's been working with the tribe for a lot of years right now. So yeah, this is the, there's a link there to that one. And then uh, on the specifically talking more about the foods that were found, there was a lot of archeology span that went on um, at this project at the Gross Preserve, which is part of Año Nuevo State Park. And Rob Cuthrell, who led that, um, led that group, um, he did a wonderful talk explaining what they found and, and also how they found the evidence of regular cultural burning on the coast that kept the prairie intact. And now they're, they're trying to restore it and it's a tough road to hold from over hundred years of not being able to take care of it. The degradation, poison hemlock that's out there, harding grass, 
you know, nasty thistles, you know, all kinds of things um, it's that have. It's poison oak, maybe. It is. It is. But hemlock's not. No, hemlock is not. And, and a host of other dozens of other weeds that are out there. So Tending the Wild is probably your best book. Some of you are probably already familiar with it or read it. Uh, at UC Davis, Kat, Kat Anderson um, is a lecturer there in plant sciences. And she had, this, this book has even become uh, like a textbook for those st students studying about it, uh, the indigenous connection, California to California plants and so on. And it's at our library, in the Santa Cruz library, you can get it there. Braiding sweetgrass, a lot of you probably heard about and trying to tell us a bit more about the connection, the relationship they had with these plants and intending these plants, which kept their populations robust. So that's also a good read. Well, um, maybe you can repeat this for me. Everybody in this room, everybody online will get an email. Uh, it's part of it. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. So. When you're translating into your soils, what's some of the preparation you do? What amendments do you do? And then if you're doing anything in pots, what's your soil blend look like for native plants? For native plants, they're very unfussy. Uh, and so um, amendments, I don't do any. I do like none. When I dig the hole though, uh, the most important thing is weed eradication as much as possible. That's your biggest threat. Um, when I dig a hole, and if I'm planting um, a, an old a plant that's maybe been in the pot and in a gallon sized pot, I'll make sure that the hole is well watered because what you want in the first years of planting is for the roots to develop. Mm -hmm. there, there's a saying with native plants, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap because what's really what's important at the beginning their adaptation to drought is to ha develop a really strong root system so you may not see a lot going on on top of the plant but there's a lot happening in the ground um so that's what i'll do uh, but as far as amending the soil or using special soils you don't really need to in most cases because you really want the plant to, the plants are already adapted to the local soil. And besides, as much as you amend, those roots are going down for a native grass, maybe five feet. Are you even able to amend five feet down? You're not, you know, and especially for trees, an oak tree, an oak tree in the beginning, and you can, an oak tree, by the way, all you need is a good acorn, you know, and, and put it right in the ground. And even in the first year, that root will start going deep, deep, deep. There's no way you can amend deep enough for that root. So it's kind of a waste of time. The most important thing to do is to make sure that the water goes deep, is you're watering deeply to help establish the plants in the first year. So if we're in a drought, like we were last year, you will need to supplement, right? And any baby plant needs water to get established. Yes. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, that's not a talk I like to, that's not something that I, I love to talk about. Um, a lot of people will plant, just to be sure, planting gopher baskets at the beginning. Now, I, we didn't. We, there were only a few things that we did. And we actually, for some reason, whatever reason, we lucked out and we did trapping. There were gophers, but we trapped them. And so we kind of, I think they ate the lupins. One, one thing that they went for at the very beginning were lupins and I tried three different lupins and then I have to admit I gave up. I did, I gave up on lupins. And I, the, I had enough other plants, like we had 60 different varieties. Okay, so, so I didn't have lupins. So, you know, but they, I actually, did not plant in gopher baskets and didn't have much of a problem. So I'm not really sure. I think maybe we got lucky, but also we're monitoring. 
And when the gophers came, we, we um, trapped them right away to not let them start making a lot of babies and then get the problem gets out of hand. But if the problem is already out of hand, then I don't know what to say about that. Does anybody else? There's gophers unlimited, I guess. <laughs> There's gopher snakes. If we can somehow, I know some people that actually have gopher snakes, right? And raptors. And it's kind of an integrated management issue. And in fact, Delise, our master gardener, Delise, is an expert in um, pest management with <laughs> vertebrate pest, pest management. So she's the better person to ask later on. Yeah, hi. Okay. Okay. Well, those are Mediterranean plants, so they're not native. And and rosemary is highly flammable. And I think we have enough rosemary planted already in, in California. You can probably walk around your block and get collect some rosemary if you need rosemary. I see lots of rosemary. I, I don't plant any rosemary or lavender. Heat ball change. Yeah. You mentioned that. You said you put down a few layers of cardboard and uh, mulch on top. And then what? And then what? Whoever, I mean, yeah. it's eventually going to be from both. Are you planting through that or on top of it? We or? did. You know, we did. But we're also, because we're master gardeners and we're managing the garden all along. So we did cut holes and plant. Like fairly quickly, we did. You don't have to. You could wait. And it have more of the plants, you know, more of the weeds die, you could wait. There's no reason why you can't wait. But we didn't wait because we wanted to have something to display because it's a demo garden. Um, and I just, we stayed on top of the weeds that poked through cracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we had vine weed. Oh. We had so many weeds. <laughs> Yeah, but we just stayed on top of it um, because the annual weeds in particular are not really that difficult to get rid of. It's your perennial ones that are spreading in many, they're propagating themselves in many different ways. Those are the ones you have to pay more attention to. Yeah. So speaking of yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And in fact, he yeah. talks about crabgrass in here. Take a look at it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He's got some good stuff on crabgrass. <laughs> oh, um, remediating crabgrass, getting rid of crabgrass. And I guess this is, we don't have a slide on this, but I highly recommend this book for everybody that came out in 2018 by uh, the one of the head gardeners at UC Berkeley. We have a question from Um, as far as taking foot traffic, um, I guess a little bit, but yarrow has been mentioned as far as being able to walk on, and also some of our native carexes, which are stronger. Our native grasses are stronger that way, that can take the foot traffic. Um, I'm sorry, what? Clover. Clover? Yeah, probably, probably clovers you could walk on. Um, is this as a, maybe you're thinking of native plants as a lawn replacement and that kind of thing? Um, so I'd say that. The ones that are most mentioned are yarrow and uh, Carex pregracilis, which is a really nice one um, uh, that I, I grew. And we have that at our demo garden too, and it can take some foot traffic. Um, so how many we notice um, that the way talking about Native American history and presentation, and you have been working on this thing um, Thrive now. So, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing to uh, restore the earth? Well, it's 
they were dispossessed from their land. So they were removed from, and they don't even live in the area. You know, that when they come to work on the project, they're coming from Sacramento or Merced or what, what they're driving long distances in many cases because they, they were not able to, they were taken off their land. And so um, through the years, and this is why it's called a relearning program because they need to relearn these things. So we're all learning at the same time. Um, and, um, you know, that takes, they, they've been relearning, for example, and getting trained in um, doing cultural burning, which is very valuable skill for us to have right now. Um, and, and then being reconnected with their plants and learning how they were used, how they would cook them, and so on. Um, and luckily, there was a um, there were a few records that were kept from one of the matriarchs in the family, where luckily it was recorded for them. Um, but today, too, the tribes, as far and as opposed to the past, where the tribes were not necessarily, you know, there were so many different tribes and they weren't necessarily connected with each other. Today, they're more connected. And so um, able to share information. So for example, white sage, by the way, we have white sage Caesar. White sage is actually a Southern California plant, but widespread today um, because it's so wonderful and because it can grow pretty much, you know, it grows well here as well. Um, they've got a beautiful specimen out at the farm. In fact, and, and we do at the Arboretum as well, um, that, that had so many special um, ceremonial uses that, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like in modern use throughout the state, they're using that plant. There were different plants that may have had different significance to the different tribes. Um, you know, tobacco for some, um, but that's the other thing that's really interesting about it is that there were the diversity in the uses of the plant, like one might have been using it as a food and another for cordage or, you know, other uses. So there's just a, a lots of different uh, diversity in in how plants were used or eaten and so on. And that's kind of like a it, it opens up your world to not having to be thinking about a plant in just one aspect, but in multiple aspects. And I, I think that just adds to our, our, the importance of diversity in general. <laughs> uh, we're talking a lot about the Amalusim and the native plants. And I'm wondering if you have ideas for researchers who want to replant or use the restoration. Well, if you want to, they have um, on their website, they have a website, the Amamoots and Land Trust. Uh, so I think it's, it's a certain Saturday of every month at Pie Ranch, the public is welcome to come and help at the garden. It's on a Saturday. So that's open to anybody. This coming Friday, they're actually asking for people to send out with uh, the links for a week. Yeah. This coming Friday. Oh, um, but you and you do need to though. It's actually it's full. It's full. I just found out yesterday that it's full. They can only manage so many people at once, so it is full, uh, and there's a wait list for it now. Yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there a way to purchase plants that we can be used in landscapes? Oh well, what we're doing is raising the plants. Yes. Um, and so uh, donations can be made to the land trust to help fund that effort. Um, yeah, because like, I think we raised like over 100,000 plants last year and have started raising tens of thousands more for this year. It's pretty exciting. And they for use up there? Yes, okay. yeah. The no, no, they are for the eventual uh, coastal restoration up there in Crow State Preserve. <laughs> Yeah. If somebody wants plants, yes. So I really want to see where you want to get. 
you could grow them, but well, you would have to get some seed and not everybody has rights to, they have the rights to collect seed for their program and they need it all. So um, the master gardeners have some seed, you know, that, and we have some today. Um, and I hope that in the future we could have a seed swap because we did start connecting with the UCSC Demeter Seed Library. And we, it would be nice to do more of that so that we could share the seed and make the seed available to you. But there are places that you can get native seed. I didn't hear you. I didn't, I'm sorry. No, I don't. There's lots of habitat restoration, different groups of people doing different things because it, there's so much everywhere, you know, that, no, I can't know of every one, just the local ones, somewhat. But I, I do want to mention where you can get some local seed. Um, Larner seeds is one. There's a little bit of low, of native plant seed at Nori's uh, gift shop at the Arboretum. And in fact, some very nice native plants too. And I think they're open today. So they've got native plants right there. Um, Larner seeds, which is in uh, not too far uh, in Marin County. Larner, Judith Larner has been seed collecting and seed um, selling for many, many, many years and you can purchase seed through her. There is now a Hedro Farms, I think it's called Hedro Farms, that um, you can buy seed from, but I think it's in large quantities. So that would be, you know, I'm not sure about the quantities there, it might be large. And so then we welcome you to, to a little bit of seed that we have and to come and get some. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. Also, I have a few number of eggs from Philadelphia's Louisiana. Well, that is the most gorgeous shrub. It's a large, <laughs> it will get, it's rhizomatous, it will get there. But it can be um, cropped back and I use one as a, um, essentially a, what I call a, um, Vegetative fence along the side of my body. I keep it pretty neat, so it holds the shield. And where do you like thimbleberry planting? Where, where do you, where would you recommend for them? I think that, well, in my yard, I have literally live in the San Francisco. And it also has a, a campus everywhere from the sun to the shade. So I keep it pretty bad. And it's beautiful. It and it's tasty. It's like a raspberry. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk more about what states Well, they're they're they are not really widespread now, native cover crops. That is something that we need more work on. But as far as our nitrogen fixers. We have native lupins, we have native clovers, we have native um, vetches and, and more. Um, I think I, I did have a picture of a, um, no, the, but for nitrogen fixing, no, it was, a oh, the acmespons, the acmespons, acmespon, deerweed, they call it deerweed, but acmespon globber, which is, just beautiful plant to have in your landscape as well. I love it. It's got those beautiful little yellow pea flowers. So I think it's just a nice garden plant, but also nitrogen fixer. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I know that there are people out there that have dogs and have cats and that have 
those questions have come up about dogs and cats and plants and ones that are, and I don't know that off the top of my head, but there definitely are recommendations out there if you were to Google it. Um, and the, what happened during COVID that was great is that the Native Plant Society ended up having to put their classes online. And so, and I, if I recall correctly, the CNPS, Native Plant Society, did a special webinar on plants and native plants and pets. They did. So I would send you to that one because that that comes up for a lot of people. No, not I don't think they do, but there was a webinar that was done about it. So I would search CNPS uh, YouTube. They have a, their own YouTube channel, and then you'll be able to see all these wonderful classes that were done for beginning native plant gardeners. They did all kinds. And there's another series that they have. It's called Naturehood Gardening, and it's a wonderful series. And they have a class, I think, almost every month that they have posted up there, and they're terrific. Yeah. Okay. So if anybody wants to come up and get some seeds. I have one more thing to add. All right. Coming soon in a series of workshops. On December 3rd, we have a fermentation workshop. It's yeah. going to fill up. If you're interested, uh, go online to the Center for Agroecology website. And we have a winter poetry festival that we have every year. It will happen in the hay barn this year. Thank you. And lots coming up next year. Fermentation, doing the native grapes from the area? Yeah, that would be interesting. No, we're doing cabbage. 